Hi, welcome back. To this my second data update for 2024. And in this update, I'm going to focus on equity markets in the US and across the world. At the start of 2023, US equities looked like they were going into a sea of troubles. If you remember, inflation was out of control and people were expecting a recession. The only question seemed to be how deep and how soon. During the course of the year, though, US equities surprised us with, a, with, with, with great returns during the course of the year. That is true. That was an uneven recovery, with seven stocks accounting for a big chunk of the returns. And you know the seven, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Al Alphabet, NVIDIA, and Tesla, and big divergences across the sectors. And we'll come back and take a look at them. But overall, U.S. equities did have a good year. Now, going into 2024, the expectations game seems to be in reset. In what way? Well, now the consensus view seems to be that we're heading not to a recession, but to a pretty soft landing. In other words, we might avoid a recession. And the other is that inflation, if not fully under control, is mostly under control. That's good news, right? That the expectations have been reset. Yes, but it does mean that stocks will have a tougher time this year because this year to qualify as good news, you've got to beat those higher expectations. Let's start by taking a look at 2023. Looking at the S&P 500 on a monthly basis during 2023, you can see that even though the year overall was a good year, we had some good months and bad months. In five of the 12 months, stocks had negative returns. In other words, five of those months, the returns on the index were negative. Now, we ended the year strong just as we began the year strong with a good November and December. And perhaps that's why we feel so, so good about stocks heading into 2024. Now, looking at 2023 as a whole and looking at returns in the S&P 500, breaking those returns down, part of it came in the form of dividends. Not much, but the dividends during 2023 accounted for a dividend yield of about 1.8%. That's the return investors got from dividends. Thank God for price appreciation, because during the course of 2023, stocks rose from 3840 to 4770 that increase turned out to be a price appreciation of about 24.2%. You add those two numbers up, your return in 2023 was 26.06%. Good year, bad year? Perhaps the best way to see how 2023 ranks is by putting it in perspective. I maintain a database where I've computed the annual returns in U.S. equities going back to 1928. And in this histogram, I look at where 26.06% falls. Not bad. Out of the 96 years of data, it ranks 24th. It's a very good year, but it wasn't an exceptional year. But still good to come back from the minus 18% return in 2022. Now, if you break down equities by sector, both in the U.S. and global, you can see the unevenness of the recovery. In the U.S., technology was the clearest winner, 58%, up 58% in 2023 in aggregate market cap, followed by communication service and consumer discretionary. Global, you see the same effect to a lesser extent, technology, consumer services, consumer discretionary and communication services. But there were some sectors that either were flat or down. Consumer staples in the U.S. were pretty flat, both in the U.S. and globally. Energy was down in the U.S., up a little bit globally, but it was coming off a very good year in 2022, one of the few sectors that did well in 2022. Real estate and utilities you know, kind of lagged the market. Utilities in particular were down both were down in the U.S. and up only slightly globally. So even though it was a good year for the overall market, you can see divergences across sectors. Breaking down equities regionally, you can see divergences across regions. Of the $14 trillion that global markets added to market capitalization, $9.5 trillion of that increase came just from the U.S. The best performing market, and this is going to surprise you, is Eastern Europe and Russia. But before you start celebrating as an investor in those markets, remember, they came up abysmal years in 2021 and 2022. So this might have been a bounce back. India had a very good year, up 31.3%, adding a trillion dollars to market cap, perhaps driven by the India story, which is that the baton of economic growth globally is going to be passed from China to India. Clearly an up market, but wide variations across sectors and regions. 
Enough about looking at the past, though. I know why we look at the past. It gives us comfort. We slice it and dice the data. We try to make sense of what the data tells us about the future. And we look for patterns. And you know what? When you look for patterns, you invariably find them. But investing is about the future. And heading into 2024, as I said, expectations have been reset. It looks like we're in a better mood about the economy, about inflation. And one way to capture the mood of the market, that balance between fear and greed, is to compute how markets are pricing stocks by computing what I call an implied expected return and an implied equity risk premium. Sounds fancy, right? But here's what I do. I take the, the prices you pay for stocks. I take expected cash flows, expected, in the future. And I solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows equal to the level of the index now. I mean, for those of you in the fixed income market, I'm computing the analog to, to a yield to maturity that you compute on bonds on stocks. Perhaps the best way to see how 2024 diverges from 2023 is to look at an implied expected return in equity risk premium at the start of each of the years. Start with the 2024 update. Start of 2024, the stock, you know, the S&P 500 was at 4770. I, ex I estimated the expected cash flows building on two building blocks. The first was earnings in the most recent year and an expected growth in that earnings from what analysts are projection. I know you're not that, you're skeptical about analysts and we'll get a chance to revisit those forecasts. But for the moment, I'm projecting out the earnings based on what analyst consensus estimates are, at least for 2024 and 2025. Beyond that, I assume the growth will converge in the growth rate of the overall economy, which I estimate to be roughly equal to the risk-free rate, 3.88%. So I've got expected earnings. But investors don't lay claim on earnings, they get, get a claim on the cash flows. Now again, if you look at cash flows in the US in 2023, we're leading into 2024, the cash flows in index units was about 164.25, with 57% of that coming from buybacks and 43% from dividends. I'm going to take that cash payout ratio, which is about 77.8%, and leave it unchanged for the next five years and beyond. In other words, my cash flows will grow at the same rate as my earnings. I know I'm building assumptions on top of assumptions, but there's no way around it. I now have set a setup for at least, at least computing that implied expected return. I take the level of the index, I take expected cash flows, and beyond year five, I assume those cash flows will grow at the same rate as the economy, so equal to the risk-free rate, I solve for the discount rate. The number that I get is my internal rate of return is 8.48%. You say, what does that tell me? At the start of 2024, if you bought US equities, especially in the S&P 500, Okay, what you hoped you would make or thought you would make, you could expect to make an 8.48% return. You subtract out the T-bond rate at the start of 2024, 3.88%. The expected equity risk premium that you're, paid, that you're going to get based on what you paid for stocks is 4.6%. So the start of 2024, the stocks in, in the S&P 500 are being priced to earn an 8.48% return and an equity risk premium of 4.6%. At this point, you're saying, so what? Perhaps the best way to understand what's happened in 2023 is to look at what that number looked like at the start of 2023. So I repeated the same process that I did in 2024, I'd done in 2023 as well. The index then was much lower, 3840. People were more pessimistic about growth, the lower growth rate. Again, but I used the same process and I solved for an internal rate of return and what I got is my expected return in stocks was 9.82%. You subtract out the T-bond rate, which amazingly was also 3.88% at the start of 2023. And my implied equity risk premium was 5.94%. During the course of 2023, the expected return on stocks has gone down from 9.82% to 8.48%, and the equity risk premium has declined. That shouldn't puzzle you. Remember, equity risk premiums reflect fear winning out over greed, and during 2023, it looked like greed got an upper hand again. Equity risk premiums have gone back down. Fear is not as much a factor. And again, to get, gain perspective, I looked at, I, since I compute this number on a monthly basis, the S&P 500, I looked at the monthly ups and downs in the expected return and the implied equity risk premium 
not just in 2023, but going back to the start of 2022. Remember, we started at, 2020, at the, the start of 2022. Stocks were at all-time highs and were priced to earn all-time lows. In other words, they are priced to earn a 5.75% return and a 4.24% premium. During 2022, fear dominated. And how does that show up? You can see the expected return rise to 9.82% and the equity risk premium go up to 5.94%. During 2023, had ups and downs, but more downs than ups. And by the end of the year, expected returns were down, as was the equity risk premium. At this point, you're probably saying, so, okay, we're at the start of 2024, price, stocks are priced to an 8.5%, 8.48%, and the equity risk premium is 4.6%. Is that enough? It's another way of asking, are stocks fairly priced? Now, to gain some perspective again, I compared that 8.48% to the expected returns at the start of every year going back to 1960. Go back to the 1970s and 80s, you can see we had an extended period, almost two decades, where the expected return on stocks was higher than 10%. A big reason for that was much higher risk free rates. You look at this century, though, through the bulk of this century, through from 2000 to 2023, and especially in 2008, we've had much lower returns and much lower expected returns. So much lower risk free rates and much lower expected returns. Clearly at 4.6%, we're at a, a, at a number that is defensible, as is the 8.5%. If you compare it to the, pre, to the, the pre-2008 numbers, 2006, 2007. So that's a, at least a modicum of comfort in that number. It doesn't look too low. Too low a number would suggest that stocks are overpriced. To see this more clearly, here's what I did. I took the expected return that I computed in the previous page and the implied equity risk premium over time, and I looked at the distribution. Again, I want to compare the start of 2024 numbers to what that distribution looks like. At an 8.48% expected return, I'm slightly below the median of expect, expected returns over the entire 64-year time period. But remember, a big reason the median is so high is what happened in the 70s and the 80s. On an equity risk premium, I'm actually higher than my median over time, which suggests that if you look at the long-term history, 4.6% is not a bad equity risk premium. Now, don't, don't, don't jump to conclusions yet, but at least on the face of it, if you're arguing that this is a bubble, the equity risk premium, the expected return, uh, don't send out the red flags you saw in the end of 1999, for instance. Now, there, is of course, there are, of course, other metrics to measure market priciness, and one of the favorites that investors fall back on is the P-E ratio. Now, here, I've actually taken the inverse of the P-E ratio, earnings price, it's called the earnings yield, it's a red line, and grafted it against the T-bond rate. Why? Because stocks have, a, have competition. You can put your money in stocks or put your money in bonds, and you can see that during the course of 2023, the earnings to price ratio decreased it was down to 4.61% from 5.7% at the start of the year. Now, as the, as, the, as, as the earnings price ratio has decreased, you're saying, but it's still higher than it was in 2020 and 2021. You're right. But what's different, though, is the T-bond rate is much higher. So from that perspective, it's a little scary from an equity perspective that you're pricing stocks to have an earnings yield of 4.6% and the T-bond rate is 3.88%. So based on the implied equity risk between the earnings to price ratio, you are clearly getting mixed messages about where equities might be going this year. Now, I, no, I, I believe that we have to take a stand when it comes to equities, that they, on the one hand or the other hand can get you only so far. Now, I've made, it, made it this confession before and I'll make it again, but I'm not a market timer. I don't time markets, but I do value the index at regular intervals. And how do I value the index? I bring the tools of intrinsic valuation that I use to value individual companies to value the index. Remember, the value, the intrinsic value of a company is the present value, the expected cash flows you will get as an investor in the company. So I'm going to do the same thing with the S&P 500. I'm going to get expected cash flows. And again, I'm going to start with the expectations of earnings that analysts use. And then we can then ask what if questions about this to get my expected earnings on the index. To get the cash flows, I'm going to start with the dividends and the buybacks. 
in the most recent 12 months. And that, that cash payout ratio, I'm going to adjust over time to make it you know, to, to make it more consistent with my expected growth rate, at least as I get to year five. In other words, my earnings are going to come from analysts. My cash flows are going to start with existing cash flows and adjust over time. So here's what you're going to see as my expected cash flows going out over time from the index. So my earnings, and you can see my 2024 and 2025 numbers are analyst expectations. And the growth rate after that, the, I, I, I lower towards a growth rate of the economy, which I estimate to be the risk-free rate. So you can see my I have two double-digit growth years in 2024 and 2025, partly because you're coming off a flat year in 2023. And then that growth rate decreases over time to get to a growth rate of 3.88%. Now, I start off with a cash payout ratio of about 75%. That's my existing cash payout ratio. And over time, that ca cash payout ratio increases slightly. You might wonder how I'm coming up with that 77.23% as my cash payout ratio in my terminal year. But to get that, here's what I do. I look at the growth rate of 3.88%. I look at the return on equity that U.S. stocks made. It's about 17.2%. And I solve for a growth rate that's internally consistent. In other words, I, you know, the, the, the payout ratio I can afford to have has to reflect that growth rate and return on equity. So I have my expected cash flows over the next five years and beyond. I use the cash flows beyond year five, the terminal year, to get a terminal value for the entire index. And I discount them all back at a cost of equity. And here I take a stand. The risk-free rate, I assume, is the fair rate because it is the current market rate. It's where I can put my stocks today, 3.88% 10-year T-bond rate. To that, I add an equity risk premium of 5%. You're saying, why 5%? Roughly speaking, that is the equity risk premium we've earned over the course of this century. It's been lower if you go back in time all the way to 1960, but between 2000 and 2024, the equity risk premium has been about 5%, 38 plus 5% gives me a required return of 8.88%. I discount my expected cash flows and my terminal value back at 8.88%. I end up with an intrinsic value for the index of 4,365. Now I could convert into intrinsic PE and trailing and forward PEs if you want, but I'm going to go directly to the comparison that matters. As I said, at the start of 2024, the index was at 4,770. And if my intrinsic value is to be believed, that would make stocks overvalued by about 9.3%. So an intrinsic value basis, stocks look overvalued. But of course, that's driven by my expectations of earnings, which come from analysts, and the assumption that interest rates today are the steady state. Now, you could disagree with both. Now, you could have a point of view on the economy. You might still believe that a recession, even though it's been delayed, is coming in which case earnings will drop. And you, let's assume that you have a pretty bad year for earnings, that they come in 10% below analyst estimates next year. Or maybe the surprise will be on the positive side. Maybe the economy will not just come in for a soft landing. Maybe it'll recover and grow fast, in which case earnings could be higher than expected, plus 10%. And on interest rates, you could disagree with me on the 3.88% being a fair rate and assume it will go down. Why? Because you have this view that the Fed sets rates. I disagree with that view, but maybe you have a strong view that rates are going to come down to 35 or 3%. Or conversely, you might be one of those pessimists who believes that inflation is just gone into hiding, but it's going to come back and rates will rise consequently to 45 or 5%. So varied rates from 3 to 5% and earnings of prices from minus 10 to plus 10%. I compute the fair value of the index based on those and you can see those numbers in the first three columns so as an example if you believe that the earnings surprise next year will be a 10 percent jump on analyst expectations a positive surprise and rates will stay at four percent a fair value of the index is 5202 i would compare that to the current level of the index 4770 and conclude that stocks are significantly undervalued now intrinsic value brings value back to today now, the conventional practice when it comes to market forecasts is to give you a target level for the index a year from now. You think, how would I get from the current level of the index that target value? It's actually pretty simple to do. Let's try this for the 4% rate and a 10% earnings growth 
and see what the index will look like a year from now based on the fair value. Remember, the fair value for the index is 5,202 today. But if that's a fair value, you should be able to earn your expected return in equities over the next year. Remember, the T-bond rate is 4%. Your equity risk premium is 5%. That's about a 9% expected return. Now, about 1.5% of that 9% comes from dividends, which leaves you with the remaining 7.5% from price appreciation. 5202 growing at 7.5% will give you 55.92. So if you want to compare these forecasts to what market strategies forecast, which is what they expect the index to be a year from now, what you will do is the, use the, col is the last three columns because those are the forecasted numbers based on the fair value today and an expected return net of the dividend yield over the course of the next year. Now, what if tables are useful but in the larger context, if you want to look at uncertainty overall, a much better tool, and this is a tool I've used before, is to run a simulation. In a simulation, rather than provide point estimates of the risk free rate, the equity risk premium, the earnings numbers, which is what I've done in my base case, I allow for distributions, that the risk free rate could be higher or lower than expected, that the equity risk premium could be higher or lower than expected, that earnings could come in below or above expectations. And I ran 10,000 simulations. You can see the results to the right. Now, part of you is saying, what do I learn from this? First is you look at the median, 4,383. That's roughly what I got in my base case, which shouldn't surprise you because my distributions are built around my expected values. But here's where it becomes useful. I mean, we talk about markets as being in ranges. If you trust this simulation, the distribution for the market, the fair value for the market today, could be anywhere from 3670. I'm taking the 10th percentile to 5200. 3700 to 5200 is a range that you can get given how the real world plays out. I'm ignoring the lowest and the highest because they, they are extreme values. So the simulation is a good way to think about how much uncertainty we face going into 2024 and how it will play out in index value. Now, before you do anything based upon my market valuations, and I hope and pray you don't, please do remember what I said about my market timing abilities, which is I don't have any. I'm a terrible market timer. And I don't try to act on my own market valuations. I do act on my company valuations, but not my market valuations. So I do believe the market, at least on an intrinsic basis, is slightly overvalued at the start of 2024. But that belief is not strong enough for me to go buy puts on the index or even alter my asset allocation mix and put less into equities. So you may say, why bother? Why do this? There are times in the past when I've done this when the overvaluation has been so significant, a few times, where it's made me stop and say, maybe I shouldn't be investing as much as I do in equities. That was the case in early 2000, for instance. You know. And in March of 2024, when the market looks significantly undervalued. But those signals are not just rare, but they're very noisy. You know, because I didn't get a signal at the start of 2020, 2008 before that particular meltdown. More generally, though, here's why I like to value the index. I mean, we're surrounded by market gurus. Some of us telling us that markets are going to go up and some telling us markets will go down. And if you listen to CNBC, you read those, finance, those views often enough, you feel yourself pulled between these extreme views. Having a market valuation as a base helps you understand where those views come from. And at, at the risk of being simplistic, if you believe rates are going to come down over the course of 2024, perhaps because you think the Fed has more power than I do, and that the economy will not just have a soft landing, but it will be stronger, and deliver higher than expected earnings, you might, you're might you going to see upside in the market. You're going to be bullish in the market. Now, on the other hand, if you're an analyst of things, inflation is stubborn, it's going to stay up there, keeping interest rates high, and that we might have avoided a recession last year, but we're going to see a significant slowing in the economy this year and perhaps lower earnings, you're going to be bearish. And I have to remember that I don't control the high ground on these views, that people can have different views than mine and be just as likely to be right. That's what it means to be a market timer, is not to be dragged into either end and essentially say, you have your views, I have mine, you act on yours, and I'll act on mine. I hope you found the session useful, and I thank you very much for listening.